we'll start off with the session all as uh, this is a very uh, enormously uh, interesting session which has been evolved in the for arc first and foremost a good evening to one and all of you for a final sessions of a very prestigious think under the apple tree we have with us today our chairman dr titial who has not joined in our co chairman dr sohas haldipurkar our convener dr rohit chatti thank you dr rohit chatti along with my dear arc panel dr anaga dr satyajit sinha dr srinivas joshi dr rohit saxena and dr harshul tak we have a very eminent array of uh, judges our most eminent past president dr mahipal sachde very sorry to say that but a glorious president till yesterday dr ashok grover dr dibashish bhattacharya dr natrajan dr avinash patanje dr raj narayan dr guru prasad ayyach dr jyotir mai biswas dr gaurav lutra dr pradeep sharma and dr suven bhattacharya truly we have a galaxy of stars to judge these very smart young innovators i would be requesting our eminent judges to pose a question to the speakers i'll take the name of the judges who have to take the question before the speaker gives his talk let's keep it very brief because we have a huge constraint of time we have 10 participants finalists who came from three preliminary rounds day before yesterday they were all to the 30 of i of them from which these 10 have come and uh, they would be contesting presenting the very superb innovations each participant has been given 5 minutes to showcase his innovation to be followed by a 2 minute discussion so here we go our first speaker is none other than a very smart Dr. john davis akara who won a prize last year too who is talking on i do i want everybody no, no. i thought he was taking attendance sir eh? what partha i think he was taking attendance i, I want, want to say yes sir uh, please yes, sir. Uh, hall coordinator mute everybody we need the session to go well so our first speaker is dr john davis akara who would be talking on spec smartphone portable eye clinic system and he would be questioned by dr mahipal and dr avinash rather uh, commented upon so on thank to you, you dr uh, john thank you ma'am uh, may i start right now ma'am yes 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 all sure, the ma'am uh, thank you ma'am is my screen visible yes okay so my innovation is uh, what i call the smartphone portable eye clinic system and this is a box of magic innovations which is a bunch of do it yourself smartphone based and portable devices for eye doctors on the go for detailed eye examination and this is mostly for post graduates and other residents who need to examine patient at bedside so this is uh, containing two smartphones a tablet an eye ruler this is uh, for measuring the eye 78 diopter lens 20 diopter lens an intraocular lens i'll come to that red blue glasses a slit lamp adapter a keracan mini top which i have made uh, during the lockdown there's a topograph this is a virtual reality headset and uh, this is my smartphone slit lamp and this is an empty plastic bottle i'll come to what these things are so an eye clinic has uh, this general uh, flow so from history examination anterior posterior segment examination to further investigations can we have it in a suitcase so history taking we have smartphone apps which will help especially during this era of social distancing and uh, language barriers these apps i know tamil and i know bangla are uh, free apps on the play store which are made by me and uh, then for general examination we can use apps i think you have seen in the news recently there are apps which can measure the pulse rate and respiratory rate and uh, this is freely available respiratory rate it checks by uh, checking the movement of the chest and using its accelerometer we can also measure anemia pallor ictus cyanosis and all those things for ophthalmology specifically we have visual acuity using the eye chart pro or the peak acuity app eye chart pro has uh, the connection a bluetooth connection between the iphone and the ipad which allows you to control the chart from where you are sitting and the peak acuity is very uh, innovative and ultra fast method of visual acuity testing uh, for stereo acuity testing uh, there is there was previously nothing affordable available all the tests are expensive i have innovated the use of the red blue glasses which are very cheap available online 
and uh, using uh, uh, smartphone apps which show a random stereogram testing. This is usually a printed RAND dot. Instead of that, you can use on the smartphone screen. You can check virtual equity, uh, stereo equity using that. Then uh, this is not my innovation. This is from uh, one idol of mine, Professor Ramesh Raskar, who is an engineer at the MIT Media Labs. And uh, he's uh, made this smartphone based automated um, refraction uh, tool. So this can measure refraction objective refraction using the smartphone screen and the lenses in this device and uh, eye uh, examination then goes on to the measurements so measurements can be done using a combination of the eye ruler and a smartphone app called image meter things such as uh, head tilt eye position can be measured using eye turn eye tilt and nine gaze these are also available on the app store and uh, this is the smartphone, uh, this is the, sorry, this is a slit lamp, uh, which I made during the lockdown. This is uh, just a battery, a bike LED. I needed a bright LED. So I used a bikes LED from the automobile store. And using that, I'm able to make a slit using a 78 diopter lens as the focusing mechanism. And I'm able to see the anterior chamber in a slit fashion. Then uh, there is also the funders examination with the plastic bottle, which I showed earlier. This is uh, very well known now. We had published in uh, 2016, me and Dr. Biju Raju. This is a modification with using a plastic bottle to hold a 20 diopter lens and funders photography. Kerak and mini top is for topography. This is a Placido based uh, topography, which I made using uh, just a paper, which was printed with mice and uh, the reflection can be captured with a smartphone. Perimetry using the virtual reality perimeter, which is a smartphone inside a low cost uh, uh, Google Cardboard headset. So this is the kit which goes from history, examinations, uh, anterior segment, posterior segment to higher investigations. Thank you. Very impressive, Dr. John. So Dr. Mahipal and then Dr. Avinash would take a brief. Uh, uh, John, I have always been uh, fascinated by uh, all your products that you're making. Uh, the only observations that I had uh, is that uh, we, have, uh, we have procured... You mute everybody? Uh, we have procured a couple of these kits, uh, but uh, the auto ref, like the iNetra that you're talking about, uh, it's lying as a piece of uh, uh, unused equipment with me because the readings, A, it is not very easy for the patients and the holding in old people's hand is not very, very easy as also the results are not reliable. Uh, similarly, the fundus photography, et cetera, that you are talking, those things, uh, they can be done. But what I would wish to say is that it needs to be reproducible because it will be text who will be going and the ease of use needs to be there. Uh, and uh, uh, so what, I, what I'm asking is, what are you doing in all these things where the reliability of the outcomes are much better? And uh, it's not to prove a concept that this can be done. I think as of now, the stage is to prove a, a concept, proof of concept that this can be done. What I'm asking is repeatability, reliability in everybody's hand. How does it compare to the standard, say, autoref, keratometers, et cetera, and those end of fundus photography, and how easy or difficult it is to train people to do that uh, with reproducibility? I agree, sir. There are some issues with the reliability of some of these. For example, the smartphone fundus photography has a big learning curve. Uh, I've tried teaching my postgraduates. Some of them picked it up quite early. Some of them still haven't got the hang of it. Uh, for the virtual reality perimetry, we have made great strides and now it is a commercial product. Uh, for the smartphone visual equity, that is quite reliable now. And for smartphone color vision and the smartphone based testing, uh, once it is validated and calibrated, it is quite reliable. For the uh, smartphone slit, uh, for the portable slit lamp, this produces essentially a slit of light. Yeah. Uh, and that slit of light is absolutely fine. Uh, the viewing mechanism currently is my own eyes and I use a 20 diopter lens to magnify. It is not as good as a commercially available slit lamp, but it will make do for a postgraduate who would uh, probably is my target audience. So if I have a postgraduate student with this in their uh, toolkit, they would really benefit from their residency. Sir. 
Oh, I do here? agree with that, but uh, the only thing is like you can't have a magnification to the extent like seeing flare cells, etc. So uh, because I have actually seen and worked on these, so they look uh, really good. But from a, uh, a commercial application, commercial availability, and B the outcomes and reliabilities, I think uh, anyway it's a uh, great work that you are doing. But uh, you need to. Uh, emphasize you need to really put in more to get uh, reliable outcomes uh, with ease. Yes, sir. You yes, kindly sir. mute Dr. Natarajan. Yes, and uh, Dr. Aminash, can I have a comment from you? Yeah, John, uh, it was really good. The thought process, what you had in your mind. A uh, few additional points, uh, apart from what Dr. Sardev had mentioned, it's validation of your product is extremely important uh, before it goes into the next phase. And I'm sure that would be in your mind. Uh, one additional point where this can hold a great promise is uh, what in, in as we do move forward in the last mile care, we're talking about when home care is going to be the next uh, kid on the block. I think this particular uh, product, what you're looking at in compilation of all of them would really find a great application. So consider about this last mile care. And I think with validation and more refinement of the product, what you have put in together, it will certainly find a place in future. Yes, sir. This has to find a place. Yes, sir. That is true. So I'll, I will work on the validation also, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahipal and Avinash and uh, Dr. John. That was also very good. We shall go on to the next speaker. I hope you all are filling up the Google Forms, all the judges. Please do that. The second speaker is Dr. Pawan Kumar, who would be talking on PowerPoint animations for learning SICS surgery. On to you, Dr. Pawan. Thank we you. Have Dr. We have our judges, Dr. Raj Narayan and Dr. Jeevan Tithyal has not joined in, probably. Dr. Raj Narayan, uh, you would take the comment after his talk. Thank you, madam. I thank the AOS ARC committee for providing this great opportunity to present my innovation in this esteemed forum of Under the Apple Tree. Now I would like to start my presentation. Madam, are you able to see my screen, madam? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my innovation is on uh, creating a simple 2D animations using PowerPoint to teach SACS. So all of us know that to excel in cataract surgery, we need to understand the basics of and the concepts of all surgical steps which is uh, beautifully demonstrated in various theory textbooks, the diagrams, illustrations, surgical videos. However, for a beginner, these can be very complex to understand. We know that animations can make things easier and can convey complex uh, topics and can, uh, it can simplify the complex surgical steps. It can give confidence to operate and uh, the outcome will be greatly improved. But to create animations, which is uh, shown on the uh, screen needs a technician, for, which, for whom we have to pay lots of money and dedicate lots of time. At the same time, we have to keep explaining each and every step to the animator. So me being an SSA surgeon cannot afford to such high, uh, high technician. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to do a jugad way of making a simple, easy to do animations, which can be done by myself. Hence, I came across with this uh, beautiful software, which we commonly use for our presentations. That is Microsoft PowerPoint. So this Microsoft PowerPoint has got various features of drawing, then uh, transition effects and animation effect, which I use to create and add animations. Few examples I want to demonstrate. So for a post-surgeon, when we are teaching that this is a crescent and the heel of the crescent has to be placed up when dissecting the sclera and it has to be placed down when dissecting the cornea. So this is to done to maintain the, to follow the curvature of the globe. They have to be heel up in the sclera and heel down in the cornea. Suppose if we don't do this uh, uh, mechanism, we can lead into premature entry causing iris prolapse at the same time. If you bend too much, then it can cause buttonhole. Similarly, beginners tend to fail making side pockets during sclerocornea tunnel. Hence, the tunnel, instead of becoming a trapezoid shape, will achieve a bottleneck configuration. So this will lead in difficulty in nucleus delivery and nucleus will get stuck at the limbus. So to overcome this, the surgeon has to do a good side pocket so that the nucleus can be accommodated very well within the tunnel and the delivery of the nucleus will be smooth and safe. So this animation will beautifully demonstrate the importance of side pockets. 
Next, we all of us teach that the fluid has to be injected into the anterior chamber through the side port only when we are in the anterior chamber. Suppose if we are at the wound and inject the fluid at the wound, that can cause a DM detachment. Similarly, when doing a vectus delivery, we have to make sure that we have to see the inferior margin of the vectus. And if you are not visualizing it, that means the vectus is under the iris. So this animation demonstrates that if we are not able to see the inferior margin, that means it is under the iris and pulling it can cause inferior iridotalysis. Similarly, by depressing the lower lip of the wound will lead to, by depressing the lower lip of the wound, excuse me, by depressing the Okay, I'll go to the next animation. This is not working well. Yeah, this is my favorite. That when we are doing a cortex wash, so uh, we all know that elephant cannot be pulled by holding its tail. So similarly, when we want to remove the cortex, we cannot pull it by holding it a thin cortical fiber. So we need to pull the elephant by holding its trunk. So we need to approach a bigger part of the cortex for easier removal of the cortex. Similarly, when we are doing a cortex wash, we have to hold the anterior part of the cortical fiber so that the cortical uh, wash will be safer. Suppose if we try to catch the cortical fiber from the anterior part, it can go touch the PC and can lead to PCR. So I've created a mini animations and uploaded in our official YouTube channel. These are available in this ROTube official YouTube channel. And I've created a series called M6 series. In the last year, this has almost got one lakh views. And recently, an international, uh, international library, online library has quoted our ROTube M6 series as one of the valuable resources to learn SACS. So in conclusion, PowerPoint animations are simple and easy to create. They can be done, done by ourselves, doesn't consume much time, and can be used as slides and can be converted into videos. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Bhavan. That was truly amazing. Very nice. Let's hear from the, our judge, uh, Dr. Raj Narayan. Dr. Raj Narayan? We need to mute everybody. Dr. Raj Narayan is not there? Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, who's ready to take his question? He's there, madam, but uh, he's, he's logged in. But anyway, you can go ahead next. So, no, no, no. Who is, which judge is ready to take a question from Dr. Pavan? We should do him justice. Anybody could come forward. I, can I? Can I? Uh, I yeah, could do that. Yes. I could do that. Dr. Avinash is saying, come, I'll uh, give both of you. Yes, Dr. Okay. Avinash. No, I think it was a very good teaching tool. It's not only the animation, Pavan. You had a story to tell. And yes. that's what was important. So you said you had a personal favorite of, you know, the elephant being caught by tail. And, and that's, I think, the highlight of your presentation was the story which came along with the animation. It's a perfect animated story. It just, I don't think so. I will give all the importance to the animation if you are not considered the story. Both put together, it's a fantastic educational tool. Keep it Thank up. You, Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Suvin, very uh, yeah, Dr. Pawan Kumar, I'm uh, really impressed by your work. Uh, we've all done animations, PowerPoint, uh, myself done a lot. And I know the amount of pain and effort and time that goes into this. Uh, you've constructed those diagrams, raw diagrams on probably on an image or paint or something, and then wrote them, or you've made them on PowerPoint itself by using shapes. Okay. And then they are, they are not very simple shapes, they are complex shapes. Correct. So you've added two shapes and made them a single shape. Uh, like the blade and the bottoms. I know it's, it is very difficult for anyone who has done this. It's painstaking and you have to keep them, group them together and move them together. So moving those animations together is a real tough job. And I have since I, after I received your abstract yesterday, I went back and saw some of your videos. They are very impressive. They are very simple. They do not look high tech, but it's very painful to construct them. Congratulations on a job well done. Thank you, sir. I just want to uh, bring out a point here, sir. If I have time, madam. Yes, yes. Dead yes sir, uh, two years back, I was knowing zero about PowerPoint, sir. I was not, not knowing anything. I just know that we have to put slide, just play slideshow. Then this, when I, when I was become an SSA trainer, I really wanted to teach my students simple, simple things, which I'm not able to convey with our uh, explanation, whatever I do. So then I went into YouTube videos. I, I saw lots of YouTube videos. And within one year, I was able to make all these presentations. And I feel anybody who is, can spend a few minutes on YouTube 
can learn a lot from PowerPoint, sir. So it, I, I feel it is not that difficult, but I know, as you said, yes, I've invested times initially in the learning, but once I got used to the tips and tips and yes. tricks, now I can easily make it uh, in an hour or two, sir. Yes, once you get a hang of it, it's very easy to do that because you. then you know the, the, game, the game plan is there with you. Thank so, you, thank you. We'll have to be a little brief because we are running short of time. Please fill in your Google forms. The third speaker is Dr. Kiranjit Singh, who would talk on Singh's iris processes for large iris defects. Let's he hear from you, Dr. Kiranjit. Could you share your screen? So I'm going to talk about, my voice is audible? Yes, it's audible. So I'm going to talk about iris implants or iris processes in cases. I'm going to show you two cases. And this patient comes to me three months after primary uh, uh, accident. Just one and minute. I'm very sorry. I want our judges, Dr. Guru Prasad and Dr. Suhas to comment on it. I'm very sorry. Carry on. Sorry. Uh, so it was three months back he had an injury and uh, the tear was, clear tear was very long and a lot of virus tissue was lost, lost in this process and so many sutures were applied. Now the patient has come for cataract extraction and he has a little bit of uh, vitreous hemorrhage also. And the uh, problem with this is that if you leave behind a defect in the iris, that can lead to um, a lot of photophobia and photophobia can lead on to and blypia, it can lead on to permanent ptosis also. I have seen in one of the female patients. And it can be a difficulty pre-marriage or post-marriage times. So I'm not sure about the status of the interior capsule. So I'm initially doing a small vexes. The patient is a young one. I am doing uh, irrigation aspiration with the irrigation, coaxial irrigation aspiration cannula. And uh, it is very soft. And the usual modality, modalities used were uh, iris segments inside the capsule bag or iris segments in the ciliary sulcus. So what I am going to show is a, a iris segment which is um, a, a stitched to the rest of the iris in the very plane of the iris. So I am done with it and after that I increase the size of the CCC and now is the time for iris implantation which is very easy. And after doing so much giving patient uh, a premium lens the work is half done because you have not closed the defect. Now, what, uh, what are we going to do about this uh, missing iris? The usual trend these days is a pupilloplasty. With pupilloplasty, what is done is uh, a slit of the pupil is created when you apply a lot of sutures. So we have created this device or processes made uh, on the platform of iris claw lens. And uh, this is a colored PMMA made by, made by IOCare. This is biocompatibility is already checked and it has claws on both sides. And what I use uh, under the cushion effect of viscoelastic, I hold the device with the help of a vertical forceps or a clay man forceps. And what I do is take it behind the iris and just with the uh, help of a 26 gauge needle or cannula, I push the iris behind the claw and one side is fixed. And then I switch the hands and I do the maneuver same on the other side also and the job is done. So we have uh, issues of these haptics showing up in the pupillary area plus the issue of this uh, dark color, uh, which we are going to get at the light color, we are going to get a near future. So work, work is done. We are, we are through it. So this is the first case I, which I wanted to show you. This is the second case in which the patient was hit by a fingernail and there was a limbal injury which caused the iris a loss, a loss of iris tissue, cataract and astigmatism of six diapters. So the patient came to us with a lot of discharge, congestion. So I we took the readings of the intraocular lens. It was a toric lens, six diapters we had to correct. So there is no point uh, putting a toric lens uh, un unless we deal with the defect. So this is a smaller iris defect uh, than the previous case. So uh, this is a toric lens with the haptics which have serrations which don't let the uh, uh, IUL go back and forth and uh, we are done with it. Now this is a small, smaller version of the same segment. It is introduced 
in the ice same manner under the viscous held with a clean and faucet and uh, just 3 seconds take uh, taken to fix the one claw on the other side i am going to take more time and uh, but it is done below 30 seconds no no bleeding no breaking of the blood aqueous barrier no bleeding and uh, no insult to the rs tissue so so i will have just have two three goes at it and now i find the right place to push and i am done with it so i have done six cases till date and patients are doing fine this is a patient two hours coming to my post uh, uh, to the opd post op and uncorrected vision is 6 by 6 thank you very much that was a wonderful innovation dr kiran ji uh, dr guru prasad yeah, congratulations uh, to you dr kiran ji very nice presentation dr kiran ji thank you sir uh this was a blunt trauma right yeah and yeah. there was that was a rupture of the sclera there yeah. Yeah, yeah. so there is a possibility that this patient may also be having uh, post segment problems like he might have he does have a uterus hemorrhage already yeah, yeah. he might have a retinal tear or a retinal dialysis which has to be tackled and yeah. the, the timing of your iris claw uh based uh, uh, iris diaphragm is something that i would like to like you to tell, tell us more about because it is only after we have tackled the posterior segment problem that we have to really put in the iris claw uh, diaphragm yeah yeah uh, because otherwise it becomes difficult for visualization of the posterior segment for the vitreoretinal surgeon so from from my table the patient was shifted to the vr uh, uh, surgery table where dr indu r singh did the vitrectomy and she said i did not have any problem doing the vitrectomy for the vitreous hemorrhage and everything was clear so from so my table the patient was so that is done only after clearance from a vitreoretinal surgeon yeah yeah the second point that i would like to make is this i saw the claws rather big and you could see that uh, the iris diaphragm was not totally covering the defect in the iris so there were some gaps in between and that yeah, could yeah. cause uh, Poly polychoria like uh, uh, you know situation uh-huh. and can lead to uh, diplopia, yeah. polyopia. Yeah. So how uh, did you get, overcome that? Actually, uh, um, in both the cases, the the defect was in the inferior part of the eye. So and we are this this is the first and the second case. So we are working on it. Yeah, and yeah. We're going to redesign. I the think monitor. I think you need to have smaller claws so that you have less gaps, less uh, false pupils and all such yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Suhas, sir. Dr. Suhas is not there. Dr. Titiyal, have you joined in? Dr. Chitra, can I ask a yes, question? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Like, uh, Kiran, I'm just wanting a little bit curious because I have burned my fingers with uh, uh, these. Uh, I'm not talking about. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, innovation. I think uh, we needed these segments to come in. but uh, i have burnt with my fingers with one of the people uh, as regards their these uh, segments which were there that were put in the capsular bag that they leached the pigment so what is the what is the material that you are using as the pigment and how are you sure that it does not leach and does not cause secondary glaucoma and uveitis because that was the problem like if uh, i started using these analytic lens way back in 92 or 93 for moisture the biggest advantage of them was that they i have i have followed up those patients even till 4 uh, years ago the pigment is very much there it is jet it is jet black and there is no inflammatory or iop uh, issues uh, related to that particular lens so what exactly is it that uh, you are using and how do you ensure as regards the trials whether you have done uh, on the long term stability of these sir i have got these uh, made from iocare people the same material they are using for they, that, that that was a pain because i didn't want to name the company and that uh, the, the the patient had secondary glaucoma the patient had uh, uh, pigment release and uh, the color of that uh, uh, these uh, things uh, were leached they they are using the same thing for putting into the capsule so i'm just uh, cautioning you that you need to be very careful because these can cause problems subsequently 
but it, it has been six months when I did the first case and I uh, I, I haven't seen any uh, any release of pigment in my eye. Okay, so just be a little careful. That's what I'm saying because six months no, is nothing. They, they, they may lie in the eye for 60 years, right? So that's, uh, that's something that you need to be careful about. That is the biggest problem. It is not very easy to get these uh, as the dark pigment and not to have any inflammatory reaction. Okay, sir. I think somebody else has also cautioned me uh, regarding this. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of us had this problem when IOCare started this in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I haven't touched IOCare again after that. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll go on to our next speaker. The fourth speaker is Dr. Shruti Vaishali, who will talk of annotating and predicting artificial intelligence toolbox for detecting diaptic retinopathy using true confocal fundus images. I would want Dr. Vishwas and Dr. Natarajan to comment on it. Uh, th thank you, ma'am. So I'll just start presenting. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'll be presenting on annotating. Uh, and... uh, I'll be talking annotating and predicting AI toolbox for diagnosing diabetic retinopathy uh, utilizing true color uh, confocal fundus imaging. So though AI has become more popular in diagnosing fundus images, the models are not widely accepted because of the black box dilemma, which basically states that it has its own self-generated rules for prediction, but the real rationale behind it is not understood. So here we are utilizing true color confocal fundus images for predicting as well as locating intricate details in the fundus image, such as microaneurysms, hard exudates, dot blot hemorrhages, up to uh, tractional retinal detachments. So we are utilizing 8,000 high quality fundus images from our private data set. And we are utilizing predefined 114 medical conditions for annotating, utilizing the Microsoft Visual Object Tagging Tool. And we use the uh, you only look once version 5 algorithm and it has helps us uh, locate and draw customized anchor boxes. And the YOLO algorithm proposed has a very quick performance of, of 3 to 5 milliseconds. So this is how we annotated each image. For a normal fundus, we first annotated the normal disk, then the normal vessels following the normal vacula and then as a whole it is annotated as normal fundus and then we have the separate images of diabetic retinopathy for my, uh, microaneurysms, retinal hemorrhages, the hard exudates, the clinically significant macular edema, the neovascularization elsewhere and the laser spots. So overall instead of marking this image as severe NPDR, we mark each hard exudate, CSME, cotton wool spots, tortuous vessels, even artifacts were marked and then following it we marked as severe NPDR. So once annotation was done, the data set was sent to a Sandstein AI toolbox and the prediction was done following which a human validation was done. So of the 8,000 images, 6,600 images were used for training and virgin 1,400 images were used for testing. So the AI was evaluated with mean average precision and the uh, intersection over union thresholds. So our data set was imbalanced, which shows that from the 113 uh, annotations, few annotations were used many times. And this is again depicted in this graph with the red area showing few annotations of uh, very high numbers and the smaller box annotations were more number than the larger box ones. So once the uh, images are fed into the AI toolbox, it utilizes a batch of eight images every time for training each class probability, each object in course and the bounding boxes. This is done for about 20,000 times before the results are obtained. So once this is done, the results are seen here. So from the initial set of training, the intersection over union was almost similar, but the objectness loss and the classification loss had fallen down, showing in increase in accuracy. And similarly, the precision and recall had increased. Uh, and overall, the mean average precision at 0.5 threshold had increased from 15% to 80%, and for a 0.95 threshold from 8% to 40%. So over the course of six months, we did the test every two months, and we can see that the prediction accuracy had increased from 79.5% to 83%. So this is the end of prediction showing that for a mild NPDR, it shows the dot blot hemorrhages, the normal macula, normal disc, normal vessels, and then the mild NPDR. Similarly, for a moderate NPDR and a severe NPDR, and for a PDR, it has marked the NVD, the fibrovascular bands, the neovascularization, the diabetic macular edema, and so far it is formed as a PDR. So we are trying to bring about an explainable AI model over here with the true confocal fundus images, which has not been reported in liter literature so far. And this uh, constant feedback mechanism helps uh, deficit the error rate over time. So the study shows that with constant training via feedback mechanism, the prediction accuracy can be increased and it helps overcome the black box dilemma. And further on, a multimodal imaging, clinical imaging with OCT, visual fields, angiography needs to be done. And this is an ongoing project which is conducted in our institute. So these are my references. Thank you. Congratulations, doctor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vishwas. 
Prasuti, that was truly amazing. Thank you, ma'am. This is a wonderful work. I but it is done by single exa examiner or. Uh, sir, uh, one we have uh, one retina specialist and one glaucoma specialist collaborating on it, sir. So they are the ones who overlook the uh, annotations which are being made, and following which uh, we send it for data analysis. Okay, very nice. Thank you, sir. So, Doctor Shruti, how much time before we have these in the malls put up and uh, people can go and uh, find out whether you have diabetic retinopathy or not? Hopefully, it uh, happens soon. It's still in a it's a baby project, and currently we have done up to fifteen thousand images. It's uh, going on uh, still, sir. So once the prediction analysis becomes good, uh, probably it will be available. So. Very good. So we should. I know. think uh, that's not in the too distant future because I think lots of lots of people and companies are working on it, and I think uh, constant monitoring of say your blood sugar with a contact lens or your like uh, health parameters and diabetic retinopathy without dilatation and uh, artificial intelligence i think that's something that's pretty much on the cards and uh, maybe the clinical acumen required may go down over time yes yeah. great thank you the fifth speaker is dr prithvi chandrakant who's going to be talking on iol scope and uh, the judges to comment on is Dr. Gaurav Lutra and Dr. Suvain Bhattacharya. Hi, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes. I'll share I'll... your screen. Yeah, I'll share my screen. I will scope. Microscope is a visual bridge connecting the macro universe and the micro universe of a living organism. It is usually used for research, diagnosis, and treatment in ophthalmology. But it is largely restricted to laboratories and also expensive, time consuming, and labor intensive. Point of care diagnostics or bedside diagnosis is known for its easy portability, automation, fast processing time reduce sample size and lower cost. The main goal is to make point-of-care diagnostics widely accessible, especially in clinics, OPDs, camps, ICU and peripheral health centers. Smartphones are now used to image both anterior and posterior segments. This helps in documentation, follow-up, prognosis, research, and academics, and for patient education. Hence, smartphones have proved to be beneficial to carry out point-of-care diagnostics efficiently. But it's in the field of microbiology, pathology, and parasitology is yet to be explored. We describe a do-it-yourself innovative tool called IOLSCOPE by just using a smartphone and droplets. Things required a chart paper 4 into 2 cm, 430 adapter in drop the lens, micropore tape, paper puncture, and a liquid adhesive. How to prepare? Cut a chart paper 4 into 2 cm. Make a hole with a paper puncture. Place the intraocular lens carefully over the hole. Fix the intraocular lens with a liquid adhesive over both the haptics. Repeat this procedure for the other three intraocular lens to make a heap of four intraocular lens. The IOL scope is ready. Fix this IOL scope with a microport tape and attach it over the smartphone camera.
how to use. Place the slide over any type of source of illumination. Here, we used a torch. Place the smartphone attached to the iOSCOPE close to the slide and take pictures and videos to detect the pathogen. These are few of the videos taken by the help of iOSCOPE. The LCD stain mount of Rhizopus. Fungal hyphae in KOH mount. Sheep port fly. Caterpillar hair showing spines along the shaft with epithelial debris. Histopathology slide of rhinosporidiosis. HNE stain slide of inflammatory cells. Early and accurate diagnosis of microbes using iron scope can act as a powerful point of care diagnostic tool, especially in familiar diagnosis cases. It is also useful for daily ophthalmology, has an extra digital zoom, easy to construct using expired unsterile broken eyelids. That is used for cataract surgery to help patients see the macro universe. Just with a small tweak, can also be used to see the micro universe. I would like to conclude by saying truly, an IOL can prevent blindness in every possible way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prithvi. Uh, I see Dr. Tithial is also there in the. Uh... Yeah, yeah, Chitra, I'm there. Yeah. So I would want you and Dr. Suvend to take one question each. No, uh, Prithvi, it was a, a good innovation. And uh, I think I had seen your uh, this presentation earlier also. Yes. And I was very, very uh, surprised how effectively uh, uh, simple IOLs can be used for uh, you know, uh, such a tool. Yes, sir. And uh, I think uh, it really is very amazing, uh, simplified thing for us uh, seeing yes. such a nice thing also. Yes, sir. And in fact, uh, I've recently finished one project uh, of similar type, which is called a foldos foldoscope. Yes, sir. Which almost similar design, where we don't use IOL, but the a lens. It can also do the same tricks, but yours one is amazing. Yes. Sir. So can I, you? I, uh, have, I have a foldscope myself. Yeah. I've tried it and I've compared it, and like you said, it uh, there is a lot of difference between. Lot of, lot of, yes. lot, of di lot of difference. So much fact, clarity in IOL scope actually. Yeah, so we had worked on, I know, epithelial cells, uh, conjunctiva, cornea, to, with the full scope. Yes. And uh, that was an ICMR study, and uh, it did work out. But after seeing your uh, presentation, we are uh, trying to do a similar study in other group of... I've seen your other presentation also, where you use for, I know, intraocular assessment also. Yes. Very, yes, good. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so... Uh, I have a little reservations over here. With you, it's a good job. It's a good job when we look at it, what you have done uh, uh, on making, constructing it. But then uh, if you say it's DIY, you expect the target user to make it himself or herself. Uh, yeah. Honestly speaking, would you, how many uh, ophthalmologists do you expect to make this on their own? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, how many people, if they want it, they can make it. That, so is, when you say, that is so easy. Yeah. So that's exactly what I was coming yeah. to. So when you say DIY, it has to be reproducible very easily it, by it, the target it, user. So 20 diaplons, 30 diaplons, all that combination to find them, get them, use them uh, yeah. is a little difficult. And I'd look at the, so if you can give me a commercially ready product, which is fully assembled and I can just fit it on, snap it onto the uh, smartphone, that would be definitely great. So yes. the DIY, DIY part is actually not a great idea. Yes. If you can get it commercially into Snap-on, that's great. Now, if I would like to compare it with a compound microscope, it's available for 2,200 rupees on Amazon. I just checked yesterday. Okay. So I think most ophthalmologists would be able to afford a, a, a compound microscope itself with its self-illumination. Okay. So you have this battery of in, uh, torch and this thing and, and all that cumbersome effort. I'm not, I'm not trying to take away any credit from what you've done. What I'm trying to say is if you're looking at scaling it up or something, you have to go to something which is snap-on and easy for the user. Yes. Okay. Uh, that, it's a good job. The idea is good, but try to get it into something which is easy for the user. DIY will not really work so great. 
yes sir, we are actually uh, into working into that we have a prototype already ready we That's are good. working with one institution to make it commercial so that That's people who really want to just uh, take a you know uh, just clip it on we are actually working on a clip on thing with the yeah. magnet and stuff uh, so it will be like out in a few months so that would be the way forward and i would say in your future future presentations take out the diy and say that you're going to come go commercial and scale it up yeah yes sir surely sir right just right. one comment i want to make that uh, that fungus hype can you can see it but yes, even smallest tiny organisms like bacteria and acid fast bacilli may be very difficult with this yes the bacterial uh, uh, is very difficult but we have uh, actually tried a study in which i have compared a fungus with the uh, compound microscope and mine and we were able to uh, give sensitivity of 100% in uh, identifying high phase of fungus and a few of the fungus we even uh, identified what species it is not all of them but a uh, few of them and uh, we are actually working on the prototype which will give us a more better sensitivity in identifying the spe uh, species also yes. and uh, we have uh, given a presentation where uh, uh, in the aiuc cell comparing the both uh, funguses thank you very much doctor we should go on to our next speaker our sixth speaker is doctor uh, kuhash jaiswal who is going to talk on eye opener a novel device for external eye examination share your screen and uh, you are going to be judged by dr pradeep sharma and dr rohit shetty chitra ma'am uh, yes we can one minute one minute just one minute yeah uh, dr kiran jit's uh, camera is on i think i don't know whether he knows about it uh, i don't know whether people know that his camera is on his uh, laptop was on uh, uh, chitra i don't know who's there in the back end uh, i would like to have some help with the judging Uh, Dr. Prithvi Chandrakant's uh, thing is going on to Kiranjit. Uh, I'm not able to proceed to mark him. Oh. If somebody can off his camera, it would be good because I don't know whether I don't think they know that his camera is on. Oh. I'll give him a call. Yeah, please do that. Thank uh, you. But uh, Chitra, can I just fix this judging thing? Uh, Sai or somebody? Should I call Sai or would you be able to? You are connected with him. You yeah, have I'll... a hotline with him. No, no, no. I'll call Sai. Yeah, please do. I'll I'll call Kiranjit and tell him that. Yeah. yeah thanks. Uh, good evening everyone uh, am i audible and visible yes yes go ahead yeah uh, good evening everyone uh, myself dr kulhar jaiswal i am cornea consultant and today i am going to speak about eye opener a novel device which we have developed during covid 19 time i would like to thanks aios committee for selecting my video and giving me this wonderful opportunity to, to present on this platform so here is a short video demonstrating my device eye opener many a times ocular examination through slit lamp is difficult when patient do not open their eyes widely often it leads ophthalmologists to use their hands to retract the eyelids during covid-19 pandemic there is high risk of contamination of gloves with tears while retracting the eyelids or accidental touching of patient's face mask while doing so this can lead to cross infection of slit lamp knobs and joysticks ophthalmic lenses keyboard while entering in electronic medical record or other surrounding surfaces so this led to the thought of opening eyes without coming in direct contact an idea of using two cotton buds was proposed but that too had few challenges to alleviate this we then came up with novel 3d printed eye opener a v shaped self recoiling eyelid retractor with each prongs measuring 7 cm in length 1 cm in width and angle of 50 degree was designed on solid work software a hole of 1 mm was made at the anterior ends of the prongs to accommodate the cut ends of the bud it was then 3d printed with foam like flexible thermoplastic polyurethane material on ultimaker a single cotton bud was cut in two equal halves and was placed in the hole at anterior ends of the prongs due to its recoil memory the prongs recoil back to its original position when released the device does not require use of topical anesthesia during examination as it touches only the skin of the eyelid 
making it comfortable for the patient. Since it is very lightweight, it rests over the eyelid without any extra support as an external speculum. After examination, the buds are disposed and the device is cleaned with isopropyl alcohol. Here is the video demonstrating the use of device during corneal scraping. As you can see, the patient is comfortable and the examiner is able to scrape without any assistant. Another video during corneal foreign body removal. Eye opener can also be used for examining conjunctivitis patients during indirect ophthalmoscopy, during force duction test, and for examining post-operative follow-up cases. Eye opener is a novel device which is easy to use, simple design, reusable, and safe. Thank you. So uh, that was a small video regarding my uh, uh, my device. So at this point, I would like to take this opportunity to make it available for large audience. Uh, anybody who is watching this session can take a screenshot of this uh, uh, this uh, uh, slide and uh, they can share it with their friends among their uh, in their WhatsApp groups. So anybody who is interest, interested in the device can scan this QR code and uh, they can download the de uh, design in their pen drive and get it printed from any nearby available uh, 3D printer shop. Uh, uh, second thing, they if they don't have access to 3D printer shop, uh, there are many websites where uh, online websites where they can upload this file and get it printed and get it delivered to their home. So uh, this was about eye opener. That's a brilliant, uh, simple, brilliant innovation, Dr. Kulash. So I want comments from Dr. Rohit Shetty and Dr. Pradeep Sharma. Uh, I think. Um... Sorry, Dr. Pradeep, sir. So I, I feel that uh, it's a very simple and a very nice innovation. And uh, it has a lot of application. And uh, the good thing is you also given uh, people access to use and uh, have their own versions of it, which is very generous of you. Thank you, and sir. And I congratulate you on uh, this. I did... Uh, I think last year for during the COVID, one of those innovations, I think this was presented. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, you know, the uh, the role of this will become increasing because we have now, uh, people are talking about slit lamp based uh, cross-linking, where the people patient has to sit on a slit lamp for a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes. It's impossible to put up a speculum and keep it. So this might be a good one. And the uh, second thing is, uh, I know I'm, I'm answering question more than asking you, but I liked it. Second thing is, you should seriously look at making this for veterinary science. The lot of veterinary science, the difficulty in treating the animals. See, I do get a lot of, uh, you know, people keep uh, the friends, dog, animals, what to do and all. It's impossible to open their eyes because they don't allow them to open. Why don't you really look at this and more than uh, uh, humans, I think animals need your innovation now because this is very important. This is my my this is my thing. Otherwise, wonderful work. Sir, uh, at this point, I would like to highlight, sir, uh, this eye opener. It uh, when the when you explain the procedure to the patient, it will uh, resist the involuntary blinking of the patient. But when patient forcefully blinks, it won't uh, um, retract the eyelid. So before using this device, you have to explain the procedure and uh, then only it will work. If patient forcefully blinks, then it won't work. Can uh, very good. We should uh, take the so it from, being started, uh, from my side. I think there's some problem with the host. Anyway, you can yes. listen to me. Yes, I think we can very be. beautiful and simple device. Dr. Kulash, you need to be congratulated for this. Yes. It's a very simple thing that you have done. 
I would rather say that if uh, for many people it might be better to have it on Amazon. You can uh, have the these made and easily available uh, for people at very small price, and this will be really useful because it's a self-retaining one, and it's very light. And maybe for uh, I mean you can have bulk orders for this. It's a something which is unique. Yes, so truly. impressive. Morning, morning only. I have checked this. So if you want to order online, you can order it with uh, 150 to 180 rupees. Just you have to make sure that you use thermoplastic polyurethane material. Okay. Very good. Thank you. The seven, we have to go ahead. We have three more speakers. The seventh Thank speaker you. is Dr. Swati Upadhyay, who would talk on uberization of glaucoma care. On to you, doctor. And uh, we have Dr. Suven Bhattacharya as a judge here. Share your screen. Yes, ma'am. I'm one minute. Ma'am, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Go ahead. So uh, thank you AIOS ARC, think under the Apple III uh, uh, panel for giving me this opportunity and respected judges, I'll be presenting my innovation on uberization of eye care. We have no financial interests. The COVID-19 pandemic has become a major barrier in delivering effective eye care. Travel restrictions, economic considerations, and fear of contracting the virus have greatly affected patients' access to proper eye care. A delay in ophthalmic care, especially in posterior segment diseases such as glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and macular degenerative diseases may lead to irreversible blindness and compromised quality of life in these individuals. Many of these diseases disproportionately affect the elderly, a vulnerable population that often needs caregivers and aides to assist them in their medical care. These added barriers, especially during a pandemic, have made visit compliance an important consideration for improving visual outcomes. Even though telemedicine has increased significantly to circumvent in-person evaluation, ophthalmology traditionally has been slow to adopt telehealth since the eye examination is often necessary to provide proper care. Fortunately, standard ophthalmic equipment has become increasingly more compact and affordable. These strides, coupled with wireless internet, have revolutionized the way we can approach delivering eye care. With compact, portable, and validated devices, we came up with the concept of Uberizing eye care, taking the eye care services to the patient's doorstep. Using our electronic medical records, we categorize patients as high risk and low risk. High risk patients who miss the scheduled follow-up are contacted via phone and offered a home visit. The appointment is booked and a trained COVID vaccinated technician with adequately equipped PPE visits the patient's home. The patient is briefed about the different eye tests that will be performed. First, visual acuity is tested with a peak chart, a smartphone based application. The intraocular pressure is measured with a handheld rebound tonometer. Visual field testing is done with a portable virtual reality based perimeter. The C3 field analyzer has shown good correlation with the standard HFA testing. The technician can monitor the patient's visual field performance using a tablet. Once the test is done, the device can be safely sanitized using UV light. Finally, a fundus photo is taken using a handheld non-midriatic fundus camera. All the findings are shared with the physician at the base hospital and a teleconsultation is complete. Uh, 
The patient is counseled about their eye medications or if an urgent in-person evaluation is required. The entire process takes about one hour. The technician gathers all the devices and heads to the next appointment. The concept of Uberizing eye care is under a pilot program in our institution. We evaluated the expenses incurred and calculated the approximate charges for the patient. This amounts to around 1500 rupees which is about 20 to 25 US dollars. When done for six patients a day, 20 days a month, the total revenue is about 180,000 rupees per month or 2,500 US dollars, proving it to be a financially sustainable model. Beyond the pandemic, the model of Uberizing eye care provides benefits both for the patients and for creating new job opportunities for young ophthalmic technicians. From our pilot experience, we believe that Uberizing eye care can become a compassionate business model for the future. Uh, that was nice, uh, Dr. Swati. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would want a very brief comment from Dr. Swain Vatacharya. Congratulations yes. to you, Dr. Swati. Very nice. But yep. we are running short of time, yep. so we need uh, to take. Congratulations, uh, congratulations, Dr. Swati. It's a good, a good job done and uh, proper use of the opportunity that has uh, COVID has thrown up to us. Uh, maybe Uberization would not be exactly the word, but anyway, the idea is that uh, you're commercializing a doorstep service. Mm. You need to be watchful about the time. This is a pre-fix, uh, pre-recorded video. Uh, good job done, but it's an excellent. Uh, I think it's a very much implementable uh, project. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. We shall go on to our next speaker. The eighth speaker is Dr. Nivian Madivanan, who would talk on CMT Flex IOL, a new option for aphakia. I would want Dr. Abhinash and Dr. Mahipal to judge him or comment on him, rather. Thank you, ma'am. Respected teacher, senior ophthalmologist, my dear friends. So I'm going to talk on the new innovation for uh, option of aphakia, the CMT Flex IOL. I do not have any financial interest. So we're going to run through a case scenario of a 360 degree subluxated lens planned for a lensectomy, vitrectomy and a secondary IOL implantation. As all innovations start with the question why, so did mine. So these are the existing secondary IOL techniques that are available, the sutured SF IOLs with the 2.4 point and then came the glued IOL technique by Amar Agarwal for more than a decade now in which they externalized the haptics. Then came the modification, the XNIC technique where they externalized the haptics to the needle and then the MNA technique where they used to cauterize the tip. But all these were different innovations using the existing three-piece IOL. So that is when the idea came, why not have a new lens design for these types of secondary IOL implantations? So for any secondary IOL implantation, as we all know, the 0, 180 degree marking is very crucial. So we use the uh, 0, 180 degree marking to make uh, two by 2.5 scleral flaps on either side. We use a crescent blade to make these partial thickness scleral flaps on either side. So now measuring 1.5 millimeters away from the limbus, a 23 gauge sclerostomy is made using a needle, or we can also use a 23 gauge MVR blade, which is done on both sides. Now, since we have a lens here to deal with, I'm using the same uh, sclerostomy to stabilize the lens and using the 23 gauge cutter through the other port, going in and performing a little bit of vitrectomy behind the lens and then puncturing into the lens and doing a lensectomy. Since it was a soft lens, I think it was not very difficult to a combination of aspiration and cutting to remove the entire lens in total. As we know, dropping it back uh, causes more problem and then we'll have to do an entire VR surgery. So lucky enough to remove the entire lens. So now coming on to the new innovative design, the CMT Flex IOL, as you all can see, it's a single piece hydrophilic lens design, which has got a specialized T-shaped haptic at the edge. So these T-shaped haptics when brought out of the sclerostomy, opens up and then prevents the lens from falling back inside. So then there won't be any need for tucking or suturing. As you can see the T-junction coming out. So these are specially designed uh, T-flex forceps 
which helps you to grab the head or the neck. And at this time, we do not pull the IOL. We inject the lens fully. And these can be done through a normal, any IOL injector cartridges through a 2.8 millimeter incision. The trailing haptic is usually left at the section or also placed over the iris. And then gently, it is pulled out. You can see a pop of the T junction. And then when it comes up, the T opens up. And then that is the end of one side because once it opens up, that design prevents it from falling back inside. So this is just a small animation clip showing the loading of the lens. The simple trick is make sure the T junction comes out first because it helps us in grasping it easily. It can be done through any IOL cartridge through a clear corneal incision. As you can see, you can either grasp the head or the neck because the hydrophilic materials, they're flexible and they come out easily through the sclerostomy. So once it comes up, the T opens up and then it prevents it from falling back inside. The other side, using the handshake technique, we use these Nishi grasping forceps, which are just serrated forceps so that there's no damage to these lenses when you're holding it and transferring. So you transfer it to the other hand and then they are brought out through the other sclerostomy. So once the T junction is out, it is almost the end of the surgery right now. You can see both the T haptics and the IOL in place. So we remove the trocars and we can close the conjunctival flaps and the scleral flaps using glue. Nowadays, we can even make a smaller groove in which we don't have to use the, uh, glue also. So we almost have more than one and a half years follow-up of these patients. And these are the immediate day one post-operative pictures, the few DM folds. These are the post-op one month picture, as you can see, round pupils. And even the sclera and the conjunctiva is very quiet. And we have studies on the UBM to see the position of the lens and how far it is from the iris. And also the OCT through the conjunctiva to see for long-term follow-up on how the material behaves under the scleral flaps. So recently we had some publications both in the local and in the JCRS as a new innovative lens design for the treatment of uh, secondary to post cataract surgery. Thank you. I'd like to thank the entire AOS channel and Dr. Chitra ma'am for this wonderful opportunity. Thanks. Wonderful, Nivian. Really nice. Proud of you. Congratulations. Dr. Avinash, could you comment on him? So I think I'll, I'll join you and congratulate Nivian and the way he has done it. So Nivian, uh, you, you, you told us why you did it. But can you also throw a small light on your journey, actually? Your... Uh, I'm getting muted. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So, even the, my question was, can you also share the short journey in a, uh, about when you're innovating this entire process? What was the journey like? Yes, sir. So, uh, the whole thing started off with, why not come up with some design where it is self-seeking that... Because initially when I was doing the glute, I was finding it difficult when I tuck one side, the other side used to release. So this was a problem which I personally had. So that is when I thought we should have some design where when it comes out, it prevents it from going back. So the initial uh, lens design was more bulkier. And at that time, we didn't know the exact uh, measurements of the... Uh... No. So you have been muted. You have to be careful not to mute the speaker. No, no, but he will have to... Everybody and the speaker has to unmute. Yeah, Nivian, unmute. Yes, sir. I think uh, JB, sir, speaker is on. Oh, okay. So the initial lens were bulkier as we didn't know how uh, what measurement is required to get it out of the sclerostomy. At the same time, it should be self-sealing. So because if there are any leaks through the sclerostomy, then again, we'll have to end up suturing or we might have an hypotony. So once we got that reading and then we modified the lens design after a year so that one, it has to be flexible. So we could not go very thin. At the same time, it had to be durable and stretchable. So we had to try to the amount of uh, the water content that is there in these hydrophilic materials. So it stretches. And we also done the tensile strength study so that when you are uh, pulling it out, that uh, thing should not break. So the, these are the things that uh, took us this journey for the last two years, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much, Nivian. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Great presentation. I have seen this before, but I think it's a great innovation. My question is on the material. Why did you choose a hydrophilic material? Why not a hydrophobic acrylic or a material like you have long-term stability studies, say for the amoth glaucoma valve or whatever it is? So why couldn't you use the, have used the same? Because we know it is inert. It does not do, undergo degradation. Infections are not there. Uh, a thought that may hydrophilic material have uh, issues as infection. Why, why did you uh, 
uh, why did you choose this material or did you try any other materials and why did you come on to this material uh, one because of the hydrophobic a little more uh, rigid and one we are we're doing a lot of intraocular manipulation so there should not be any other injury to the tissues and also bringing out these hydrophobic materials out to us little uh, difficult and they are very hard but as you say we can come up with some hybrid material i think i think jb we can come up with some hybrid material so that's a good suggestion like okay. how the rainer materials have maybe i can uh, think of that those lines also sir yeah just try some other material because you need to be sure as to the uh, uh, the long term durability of that and materials which may have been checked before so just just a thought otherwise yeah. fantastic uh, uh, great uh, innovation and was there hypotony associated like you have in the blue dye oil in the uh, period uh, because uh, there is the sclerotomy that is there right yes sir so that is when the initial thing we were not sure about the uh, length of those teeth sir so the we had uh, done a modelize and to check so that this snugly fits into the sclerostomy when it's 23 so there is no leakage absolutely that's why even our newer techniques we are just doing a groove so we don't even need the flaps or you don't have to even put glue over the flaps at the end of the surgery so that even the anterior segment surgeons can use it this is bad here what is wonderful uh, i think we have to move on nivian and you, uh, please take care of the sound uh, the ninth speaker is dr ayan mohanta who would present on force measuring suture tying penetrating keratoplasty forceps and dr rohit shetty you are to comment on it yeah <clears throat> is my slide visible yes 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 yeah so uh, good evening all of you uh, i'll be talking on force measuring suture tying penetrating keratoplasty forceps which i have developed a minimum of 16 interrupted sutures are required in a case of optical penetrating keratoplasty and the visual outcome depends on the resultant astigmatism and the resultant astigmatism depends on the tension of the individual sutures so what if we can measure the individual suture tensions if we can quantify the tensions of individual sutures we'll be able to achieve astigmatic neutrality so whenever we hold the forceps there are two forces act on it the force required to hold the forceps and the force required to pull the suture and tie the knot a little bit of research i found this uh, tiny little device it's called a force sensing resistor which was put to use this fsr decreases its resistance depending on how much pressure is being applied to the sensing area the harder the force the lower is the resistance it is a very quick rise time of 1 to 2 milliseconds so it is made up of several thin flexible layers and the more it is pressed the more resistive carbon elements touch the conductive silver elements over here and the resistance decreases so it's just like this if we press the resistance decreases to minimum so this fsr was placed inside a 0.12 forceps and it was connected to a multimeter which is commercially available so this is the entire setup uh when the sensor gets a push the resistance changes the aim is to tie the first knot and the second locking locking knot at the same level of resistance meaning equal tension to all the sutures so this is the caravic eyeball which is discarded so on which a 7.5 mm trephination was done and this forceps was put to use so whenever there is a change in the sensing area you can see in the multimeter the values are changing so this was the setup like the problem with this prototype device is it enables a digital display that too in a multimeter and which is a very crude way of measuring things and it is impossible to look at the display while tightening the suture and the solution is a auditory input so this is my next uh, project i mean i'm going looking for a sound output from a small uh, single board computer it's called a, you know how do you know you know which is attached to this sensor 
and a no sound state. I mean, we, it will emit a sound. And when the tension is per perfectly reached, there will be no sound from the speaker. So that, that will be the end point of tying the switch or not. So these are the, some application areas. It is used for following further refinement, pending ethics committee appro approval. It's for training and teaching for cornea residents. Other areas in surgical field where suture tension is of utmost, utmost importance with respect to outcome like CTVS. So it needs to be more refined. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ainwata. That was nice. Dr. Rohit Shetty, your comments? Thank you, sir. Nice, very nice, uh, simple innovation. So really okay. helps in uh, training uh, the postgraduates. A uh, question I want to ask you is, how do you want to bring this uh, tensile strength uh, features in that you, will you want to bring a forceps which will have it or some remote sensing way? No, it is a forceps uh, which, uh, which will incorporate the sensor and for making it remote sensing, it will be more bulkier. So it will be a simple wire that will be like a thermocottery we are using. It will be such, uh, like an instrument like that, which will be held in the left hand so that not much of movement is required while you are tying the switcher. So it will measure the tension in my left hand and the right hand will be more mobile. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We go on to our last speaker, Dr. Pawan Kumar, who will be presenting on giving life to surgical training to GoPro Live. I would want Dr. Guru Prasad to comment on him. So, Dr. Dr. Pawan, share your video and start. Yes, sir. Yeah, only. I, I again thank uh, Dr. Krita. I again thank AOCRC committee for providing this opportunity. So, my innovation is uh, giving life to GoPro surgical training through GoPro Live. This is a, a portable camera-based surgical video recording system. As all of us know, ophthalmology is a combination of both medical and surgical field, and we need to have good exposure in both the fields to excel. In certain areas, surgical training for residents and fellows are inadequate, and it is further complicated with COVID times due to decreased patient flow and reduced community outage activities. We all know that surgical videos are very helpful in training. It can be used to do video-based coaching. It can be used as self-assessment and evaluation. It can be used as a video-based assessment, documentation, audit, and quality improvement, and can significantly improve surgeon performance. Uh, whereas the traditional video recording system is not available in all theater, live voiceover cannot be given when operating, and it is difficult in recording in sometimes, and accessibility of the video is also difficult, and sometimes it is more costly. Hence, we... GoPro is a compact GoPro. action camera, mainly used by sportsmen and people involved in extreme action. With a dedicated app for both Android and iPhone, the GoPro camera can pair perfectly with any mobile device to access a variety of features. With inbuilt Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, the users can go live. GoPro has inbuilt speaker through which the user can give voiceover to what is getting captured in the camera. We have mounted GoPro camera to the side scope of the surgical microscope which is paired with a tablet through the GoPro app. This video recording system has turned out to be extremely useful during the COVID times. Learning from the experts When an expert surgeon is operating, the surgery can be live streamed as in Facebook or YouTube, which can be watched by the junior surgeons through their smartphone or laptop easily at their own place. Since GoPro comes with an inbuilt microphone, the operating surgeon can give live commentary of the steps being performed. The rexis should be performed under high molecular weight viscose. This will greatly benefit a larger group of students. Guidance from the seniors When a junior surgeon is operating, the live video streaming can be used to get guidance from the trainer or any senior surgeon. Junior surgeon can present their problems through the GoPro microphone and the trainer can keep adding comments in the comment box which can be conveyed to the operating surgeon by the assistant. Even though a telephonic conversation can also be used to get guidance from the trainer, the discussion can negatively disturb the patient who is getting operated. Telementoring Once the initial training is complete and the trainee has started performing surgical technique independently, monitoring of the surgery by the mentor stops at that stage. 
mentor reviewing the trainee's surgical performance after a certain number of independent cases can greatly increase the trainee's efficiency. Many a times the mentor may be staying far from the trainee's place and frequent travel to guide may not be practical. GoPro recording system can help in telementoring either during live streaming or reviewing the surgical videos at a later time. So this is the quality of the video. What when young patients mature attack, the nucleus is very brittle. No? It is like a cookie almost. It's operating. And a beautiful thing is these videos can be shared live through Facebook or YouTube and this will be stored and it can be watched anytime when the resident or the fellow is free. And uh, we even do a program where a senior support uh, uh, shows all the all the operative settings. Uh, and we ask all the uh, people who use this uh, system to score as per their uh, relative advantage, simplicity, compatibility, trialability, and observability. And overall, it scored almost 22.3 out of 25. So in conclusion, it's a simple and easy to use uh, video recording system, which can give a high quality surgical video recordings. It's a cheaper alternative to traditional video recording system and very successful use for live streaming. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pawan. Dr. Guru Prasad, your comments? Yeah. Thank you, Pawan, for that uh, nice video. You already have the marks 22.5 out of 25. I don't think we need to judge you anymore. Uh, the, the audio uh, input is really nice. The, the running commentary that you can give along with the video recording is something that is very, very appreciable. And uh, uh, the application of that feature is very, very good. I'm just concerned about the quality of the video. We spend lakhs of rupees on visualization and recording. And I'm just wondering how the quality of such a cheap uh, GoPro video would be. Uh, you have shown some videos, no doubt, but uh, when it comes to the intricate steps, uh, I'm, I wonder how it will be in, uh, how it will match with the, uh, the ones in the market. Yes, we can uh, get a video quality up to 4K, 4K also, sir, from this uh, GoPro. And the biggest advantage is the video output, the file size, what we get in this GoPro is somewhere around 800 MB and it'll be 1 GB, even with good quality 4K. Whereas the traditional video recording system will give up to 8 GB, 10 GB. So this is more easier to acquire the video and edit the video also, sir. Uh, how much did you say the storage was? The storage, when we get output from this, it'll be somewhere around 800 MB, 1 GB, 2 GB maximum. Whereas the traditional will give up to 8 GB, 10 GB, 12 GB, the same quality. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Yeah. I would uh, want all the judges to fill in the Google form. And uh, immense thanks to my expert panel and great judges and a terrific team of innovators gave us wonderful 85 minutes, a very lively moment. Thanks a lot. Uh, you would be updated about your results. And I wanted to tell you that I do hope that you grow from strength to strength and uh, come up with whole range of innovations. And I see most of you again for this Think Under Apple Tree next year. Thank you very much. Thank you.